Thanks. Well, thank you very much for accommodating me. I apologize I couldn't be with you in person. Um, so I wanted to uh, reflect a little bit on uh, the key questions and challenges that, as an outsider, I see this, this program facing. Uh, so why don't we start with the second slide uh, on key driving questions. So as, as I think about this going forward, you know, I think we need to ask a very fundamental question, like, you know, why study diverse populations in the clinical genomics setting? You know, you know what are the potential scientific gains that we uh, hope to, um, to realize here? And as a way of setting this up, I, I thought about what is it that we've learned from, you know, broadening representation in GWAS and, and Mendelian disorders and, and a little bit about what we're seeing as, as part of uh, ClinGen and, and wanted to speak a little bit about that. Uh, in particular, if, if we are going to go down the route of having, you know, multi-ethnic studies, how do we design those so that they have maximum power for discovery and interpretation? And, you know, the, the key question to sort of set up is, do we want proportional representation? You know, should it be, you know, roughly the uh, proportional to the population representation? Or do we want stratified sampling? Or, or how do we think about that problem? Um, and then, you know, really as an outsider, and this is something I'm, I'm obviously not an expert on, but one that, you know, it seems to me is important is how do you think about modifying existing protocols and, um, and what you're already doing in recruitment, consent, enrollment, return of results in a multi- and trans-ethnic clinical genomic setting? You know, are there differences that we need to take into account, and how do we set up research in order to make that happen? You know, do individuals of different ethnic backgrounds interpret genetic results differently? And if so, you know, how do we then modify and, and think about all those um, LC issues? Next slide. So, you know, some of you know we've uh, been interested in this problem for a while, and uh, and in the context of NHGRI, probably the, the some of the best data out there are the results of the Thousand Genomes Project, and you know what we described in the first phase has now been seen in phases two and three, namely that common genetic variants are actually pretty rare, even though they tend to be shared across populations. So if we think about a common genetic variant that's, say, at about 15 percent frequency, well, they're nearly exchangeable across European populations. And so you don't really need to think too hard about population stratification because it all ends up working out. And furthermore, what you would learn in a European population is likely to translate into other ethnic groups. However, common genetic variants are a very small sliver of all genetic variants, and those rare variants that are now much of our focus and what you end up finding in both sequencing studies, particularly clinical genetic sequencing studies, are pretty rare. And of course, population private, and now how you design the study makes a huge uh, impact on how you are able to interpret the results. And one of the key issues, and, and Jim talked about this, and Heidi and others, is that you know, the, the VUS rate is different across different ethnic groups. And so how do we begin to challenge that and, and think about that problem? So, you know, in, in our work, what we've done is, is try to pilot broadening representation in, uh, in, across, you know, global populations. And so we've, you know, got active projects all, you know, all over the place and try to use uh, patterns of genetic variation to try to draw inferences about what the world could look like if you were to scale up in, in different ways. And, and I just wanted to give you one you know, quick example of this um, in, in the next slide, which is the uh, back of your slide in, in HLA. You know, this is an association that's been known for years and years and years. It's incredibly important. It's on the pharmacogenomics VIP list, and, and it's actually a pretty common variant. And of course, as, as we all know, you, you need to test for it if you're going to put a patient on a back of ear, because if the patient carries a particular H, HLA haplotype, then they're going to have a, a really nasty reaction. Um, and if you keep giving that patient a back of ear, then you know, you're going to put their life at risk. Okay? And what's interesting from a population genetic perspective about this variant is that this global distribution is anywhere from extraordinarily frequent. So if you happen to be implementing this in India, then you really need to worry about this. It's a 20 percent frequency, and you should be genotyping everybody all the time. Whereas if you are in Japan and, oddly enough, in West Africa, then it's at very low frequencies. And the, the point I want to make with this is that there is no real population genetic model out there that would tell you, yep, the Gujarati and the Maasai are going to cluster, and then it's going to be Utah, and then you don't have to worry about your Rubens, right? It's, it's all basically empirical. 
And so you really need to go out there, characterize these variants, and genotype them in a broad array of populations uh, with good uh, clinical outcomes data so that you can really assess what's important, what's not important, and what populations. And that's really kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it, right? As you go forward and, and try to take this project to the next level, you, you need to figure out where to invest, you know, and, and how to make those key investments so that the results are interpretable. You don't, you don't want underpowered studies. And so, you know, enrolling 2% of the population to be, say, you know, ethnic Hawaiians may give you 10 ethnic Hawaiians, but, okay, you know, is that going to be useful or not? Or So how, how do you think about that? Next slide. Um, so what we are seeing in broadening GWAS results is that it works. Right? You know, if you go out and you properly power GWAS in a multi-ethnic study or you go out and you study other populations, you number one find new variants at existing genes that are important and interestingly you're also led to new genes that you wouldn't have found by just focusing on say Europeans or, or Asians and, and there's some very nice examples out there. I've just you know, pulled together some here. There's the, the work by the Broad, for example, in Mexican populations in SLC 16A11, which is a very common risk factor for type 2 diabetes and largely absent from non-American um, populations, right? So this is a, an allele that arose uh, on a Native American background. Interestingly enough, it actually comes from Neanderthals. But, you know, to make a long story short, you, you basically only see it in, in populations of Native American ancestry and, and low frequencies elsewhere. Um, and that's totally new uh, diabetes genes. Uh, from, from our work, we've looked at skin and hair pigmentation, and we found that in different parts of the world, skin and hair pigmentation actually may be under uh, different genetic influences. And, and so the same may be true for lots of other um, uh, traits that you'd like to study. And so, you know, I think the NHGRI investment here has been quite successful in broadening representation. And I just want to give out a, a special shout out to Paige. Next slide. Uh, where the next round of PAGE, we've, we've been you know, privileged to, to be part of this design of the new multi-ethnic uh, genotyping array where we've put together you know, variants that are clinically relevant. We've created a GWAS scaffold that will you know, be properly powered in lots of different populations by giving a lot of thought as to how, how we do that and have kind of set the stage to, to make this happen. And we've got the first bolus of data in and, and are beginning to, to see really cool results. Um, uh, so if, if we turn to slide eight, you know, I would say that the, the current state of the field is that, you know, 1,000 genomes, population-based sequencing has taught us that common variants are rare and shared, and that rare variants are common and largely population private, right? So, so we've kind of solved that population genetic question. Um, secondly, that properly powered GWAS studies and understudied populations are leading to novel variants of previously associated genes and new genes underlying previously studied phenotypes. So this will work and it'll help and it definitely makes sense if, you know, what we're seeing in common uh, diseases and, and now rare diseases is, is going to translate into to a real kind of clinical genomic setting. Um, I would say that the, the other piece of data that for us has been very interesting is we've been working with the California State uh, testing program for CFTR and have now about 4,000 CFTR variants that are the variants that we see here in California. And what you see is that, you know, yes, you know, we, we still have, our, of course, our Delta 508 in, 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 in European populations, but when you look at, for example, um, you know, Hispanics that don't have a lot of European ancestry, they have a whole different set of variants that are actually also really important. And, and the only way that we can break that VUS curse is to actually bring in the clinical data. And so it's in fact because through the Stanford CF Clinic, we've gotten access to several hundred patients that have been carefully followed that can actually go in and make good clinical determination for those variants. Now, it's, you know, in many ways, it's a very modest step. You know, we've taken a well-studied gene, a well-studied system, and have begun to break down the VUS rate and, and, and help ameliorate some of these issues. But it, it's going to be a kind of boots on the ground effort. I, you know, I'm afraid it, it really is likely to be a slog to, to make this happen. And so, you know, to, to properly think about the program, we're going to have to make some tough decisions about where to invest. So, you know, I'm, I'm of course, very supportive of, of building diversity into Caesar, and it's likely to yield new opportunities to learn new biology and improve patient care. But we've got to, 
really think hard about how to do it. You know, just kind of going out and getting the samples you can, the samples of convenience, may not be the best way to go. And so you, you may want to pilot, for example, investing in the next Caesar site to be a minority Caesar site because then you'll have one properly powered site. And, and if you think about the ESP project, you know, they did a very nice job of having equal number of whites and, and African Americans, right, because we wanted a properly powered study. Um, and, and I'm sure Debbie can, can speak to that. So, so my last slide is just some thoughts as to how to frame the discussion and what I see as the key challenges. I, I think the first one is, do we want representation to be kind of proportional, so 65% whites, 15% African Americans, 10% Hispanics, whatever, or do we want stratified, right? And, and how do we think about that? Because those are tough, tough decisions to make, and you know, because you're in a clinical context, you may not even be able to get stratified sampling if, if that's what you want, so you have to think hard about the next set of sites. Um, I'd say the second big challenge is how are we going to break the higher VUS rate in, in non-white populations? I, I think that's actually a really important question and one that's going to require some deep thought, you know, um, and, and some pilots to make that happen. Um, the third point is that, of course, inclusion doesn't just mean ethnic diversity, right? And we can imagine that socioeconomic status, education are all going to impact enrollment maybe genome inter interpretation, and certainly result, return of results, right? So if you're dealing with a topic as complex as genomic medicine and you're dealing with vulnerable populations, uh, individuals that, um, you know, may have variable insurance coverage and we know what are they going to do with this information, you know, it's a, it's a very deep LC question and, you know, something I'm no expert on, but, you know, even a naive population geneticist like me can see that this is going to be important. And then the last point is that, you know, and we had a meeting about this two weeks ago, that new technologies pose a risk to broadening health disparities. And so while genomic medicine could improve, and, and we hope it's going to improve health outcomes across all populations, the rate of improvement could really be different in different ethnic groups, by ethnicity, by race, socioeconomic status. And so, you know, are we going to accept that? How do we study that? I actually think that this is an area that a uh, bit of LC funding could go towards and, and really think about how to develop the countermeasures to, to exactly that, that issue. And so um, with that, I just want to thank you all for allowing me to, to give my thoughts. And uh, as always, it's a, it's a privilege to participate and uh, happy to take any questions you might have and be part of the, the discussion going forward. Katrina Armstrong from MGH. I guess one of the things I've answered in the panelists or Carlos um, on the phone, one of the things that I struggle with in this area is we spend a lot of time working on community health and health disparities. And, you know, we spent decades really working with the community on what are largely now seen as the critical determinants, which are these are the social determinants in our communities that play a huge role in health disparities. And so one of the challenges, Jim, so I guess I, I, I unfortunately can't hear the question, so I'm going to need someone to just repeat the question for me. Is that the question for me? Well, maybe I'll defer to the management on that one. So, Jim, maybe I guess as you think about, you know, the, the let's say, the challenges of participation, I think one of the challenges as we've worked, let's say, in precision medicine and communities is that on the, their list of problems to solve, Precision medicine is not high on that <laughs> list, let's just say. I, yeah. And so how do we also, I, I would argue, maybe bear responsibility for figuring out how precision medicine is actually useful to some of our most disadvantaged communities as we ask them to participate in that? And how did you deal with that? And uh, do you have thoughts about how to do that? Yeah, I, I think that's, you're, you're dead on. Um, you spend some time in, in a general medicine clinic and you realize that people, opportunity costs matter and they're real. And everything that somebody does precludes something else. And when you've got a job that doesn't pay a lot and you've got a, a you know, social situation that's, that's uh, fragile, um, things like precision medicine don't mean nearly as much as, as approaches to, you know, getting people to quit smoking and eat right and et cetera. Um, so I, I think that's a challenge for our field. And I think that we, we do probably, we are probably guilty of, of um, 
excessive boosterism when it comes to the um, value of precision medicine when we know that we could get rid of a lot of diseases that are out there through, through uh, um, techniques that are, you know, if they could just be applied, would be effective. I, I, I think that the answer to that is that if the gains aren't going to be as great as some of us would like in precision medicine, um, we have to try to make sure that what gains we do get are equitably distributed, right? So that's so I, I actually think that pessimism, or, or I would say realism, towards the potential for precision medicine is an even stronger mandate to make sure that we include um, everyone. Because if we don't, the smaller than expected gains will be absolutely minuscule in those populations. You know, would you, would you say that, you know, maybe some areas like, you know, pharmacogenomics are ones where there is a, a, a pretty direct benefit, and so, you know, we, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, at least in that context, we're giving people the, the right medicine if we know that they're, they've got a genetic uh, uh, predisposition that would not be, you know, not allow them to be good responders, right? I mean, is, is that a particular area that makes I, I don't sense know. I mean, to focus I, on, could, or are there other areas? We, I guess, Carlos, we could quibble about that all day. I'm not sure pharmacogenomics has really shown the promise that many hoped it would. Um, I think that it is an example where specific populations can be dramatically affected and others not. So the best example of that would be, um, you know, some of the HLA alleles associated with Stevens-Johnson syndrome um, being being vastly uh, overrepresented in Asians. Um, so it might be an opportunity, but I, I'm not sure I'd want to put all my chips into pharmacogenomics. I, I don't disagree with the point because I do think that social determinants are really important. And in my experience, um, I haven't seen any of the communities with, with whom I work say I really want more genetics. But I think that, uh, but I think what excites me about precision medicine as it's being defined now is that it's beyond the scope of genomics. It includes um, data on social determinants and understanding the ways in which genomic um, or biological factors interact with social determinants. And one thing that strikes me just from the previous session is that um, even with a well-defined conceptual model of psychosocial and behavioral outcomes, I would just make an observation that there perhaps is not sufficient attention to social determinants and ways to link and integrate that data um, with this, the, the, the sequencing enterprise and activities. I can't hear the question. He Hello. Hey, Carlos, I know you can hear me now. This is Debbie here. Um, I, uh, I don't disagree that we need lots of ways to bring in populations into, into medicine in different ways and in precision medicine in, in particular. But I also think we need to increase the diversity of our workforce. We need to work really hard at this harder than we've ever worked in our whole lives to do this. And I think Caesar, with all of the many clinicians that are in this room and will be here tomorrow, could really impact and change this. And I, I, I think bringing some of the populations in as new groups in the future is so key. I mean, if we don't have the information, we can't provide new insights. You could have a lot more VUSs like Carl's is talking about, but they'll never move from being VUSs to anything else if they just stay there and are not linked to phenotype. So I would urge us, more than urge us, it's past time that we did some large-scale studies in the many populations that are represented in the United States that have not been resent presented in genomic research at uh, really significant levels.
You know, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I would say that um, in talking to my CF colleagues at, at Stanford, I, I've totally been won over to that point that, you know, CF manifests as a somewhat different degree, disease in Hispanic Latinos, and, and that could partly be because of the different variants that are uh, segregating in that population, but it could also be uh, due to all kind of socioeconomic factors, access to care factors, um, you know, getting um, identified early on. And so, you know, if you really want to put this into practice in perhaps some of the communities that are most affected, then, you know, it, it's going to happen by bringing in and linking the clinical data to the genetic data. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think we're in violent agreement, Debbie. 